happy to have you and we're so happy to have Dan. So I'm gonna turn it over, my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Dan Stringham. Well, thank you very much. Let's just do a sound check. Uh, people can hear me and see the screen. All is well. Deb, would you shake your head if we're good? Okay, all right. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us tonight and thanks to the museum for uh, creating this event. Uh, I should say that I have given many of these kind of presentations to all sorts of groups, but I've never done a virtual presentation uh, about this mountain. And I'm hopeful that uh, with uh, the technology that we can still have some good back and forth, preferably uh, towards the end. I'm, I'm, I really like the kind of questions that start off with, uh, what were you thinking? And then they ask a question. So hopefully we can have some of that good banter back and forth. Uh, in the two years since I've been home, I have uh, asked, been asked a myriad of questions about this mountain, which I am always happy to do. Uh, at this point, I've got a pretty good idea of the sorts of things that people would like me to cover. Uh, of course, everyone wants to know what's it like up on the summit, but I always get the questions along the lines of, did you see any of the dead bodies that are up there? Or did anyone die when you were there? Or did you see frostbite and broken bones and just every other form of human suffering that you can imagine? And the answer to all of those questions is yes. I had a front row seat to everything. And uh, no discussion, I think, of Everest would be complete without some discussion of those items. Uh, I would also add that I've probably been asked every conceivable question about the bathroom situation, which I have uh, no intention of addressing in, in this forum. If you're desperate for that conversation, um, send me an email, danstringham at yahoo.com, and we'll have that conversation. But uh, I will certainly cover uh, the mechanics of, of the route and the suffering that goes on up there. But I also want to cover... Uh, it's not working. Here we go. Some of the lessons that I learned and that I relearned when I was there. I, I do think that this kind of completely over-the-top experience can create a kernel for anyone to take home and chew on in a, in a quiet moment. Um, I recognize these are my lessons learned. Let's call them my truths. And if they don't resonate with you, I'm hopeful that you'll at least take them in the spirit in which they're given. We're going to spend uh, more time on the slide that's on the screen now than any other slide. I want to, one, orient you to the mountain. When you hear me talking about various spots, you'll know what I'm saying. Plus, I also want to give you some sense of what altitude looks like. So what's, how high is high? Uh, this picture is the best picture you can imagine of base camp and the four camps you have to pass through on the way to get to the summit. What it doesn't show is the uh, eight to 10 days that it takes uh, to be able to uh, even get to the point where you can start at base camp. This particular shot, or this climber here, is our head guide, Temba Sherpa. Uh, the Sherpa people are indigenous to the Himalayas, and almost all of them are somehow connected to the climbing and tourism industries that uh, go on in Nepal and really fuel their economy. In this picture, Temba is standing on a summit on the opposite side of the gully where base camp is situated. So quickly, down in here is base camp, 17,400 feet. What does that look like? Uh, most people have probably at least flown over the Colorado Rockies, or you may have spent time at the Denver airport and looked to the west to see those mountains. The, the tops of those mountains are, let's round it, let's call it 14,400 feet. So if you took nine football fields end to end and you tipped it up vertically, that's at the height that you are at base camp and you're just getting started. When I was there, there were about 650 people in that camp. There were 350 of us that were climbers like me, all of which who had paid $11,000 to the Nepal government for the privilege of going one foot above base camp, and the rest were the support staff. So once you leave base camp, you immediately enter into this area called the Kumbu Ice Fall. It's a five hour climb through what is a very hazardous and even lethal uh, stretch of the mountain up here to Camp 1 at 19,600 feet. What makes that ice fall so dangerous and why so many people have died in it is that it moves three feet every day and it takes with it uh, ice blocks the size of your house and it opens up cracks or crevasses as they're called that are so deep you can't even see the bottom. 
Once you're here at Camp One at 19,600 feet, you're higher than any place on the African and European continents. So you may have heard of Mount Kilimanjaro. You're higher than Kilimanjaro. From Camp One, you make your way up into this canyon up to Camp Two at 21,300 feet. This canyon is known as the Western Coombe. That's called spelled C-W-M. That's a Welch word that means uh, dish or valley. Uh, I should also say you're looking at the Nepal side of the mountain and this is the south route or sometimes called the southeast ridge. At this point right here you're already higher than anywhere in North America. Uh, Mount McKinley or Denali in Alaska is three vertical football fields below this point. Up on this big open face to Camp 3, a place where you wouldn't want to spend five minutes, uh, at 23,700 feet. At this, at this point you're higher than anywhere on the planet and yet you are 20 hours of continuous climbing still below the summit. From Camp 3, we then pass up here to this little notch to Camp 4 at 26,000 feet. You don't sleep at Camp 4, you rest there for a few hours before you start your uh, push to the summit. You are just inches below what's known as the death zone, and we'll talk about why it's called the death zone uh, in a bit. You leave around eight o'clock at night and you uh, push for 12 continuous hours up this ridge, passing the south summit as the sun rises and then arriving up on the summit at 29,030 feet um, uh, earlier in the morning, which I should add that um, we arrived on the summit at 9.53 p.m. Eastern time, Thursday evening, May 17th which if you account for the change in the calendar, it was tonight. So it's two year anniversary of standing on top of the world for me. So what does 29,030 feet look like? Uh, if you go outside on a clear day and you look up and you, look up and you see those streaks across the, the sky from the jet engines from the airplanes, that's about the height of Everest, that, some rough idea. So that's the, that's the way most people go. The next most popular route we'll call it this way, on the north side through Tibet and through China. The other landmark I wanna point out is this mountain peak right here. This is Mount Lhotse. It's the fourth highest mountain in the world. It's a 28,000 foot peak. And I point it out because we're gonna talk about this big open face. It's the Lhotse face. All right, from there, let's, uh, let's move on. No time like the present to talk about uh, one of those lessons that I learned and uh, it's this one. Number one lesson I learned, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you put your mind to it. When you're just so singularly focused on something and you want it, um, it taught me that, that I could do it. Um, it taught me, to say it another way, that I could do hard things and just really dig in and go. And it, it's not just the time on the mountain that I'm discussing. Uh, for years, I thought about uh, climbing this mountain. I trained for it. I climbed other big mountains and it was just an amazing feeling to ultimately satisfy that goal two years from tonight where I stood on the top of the world, only in this case, I'm sitting on the top of the world. This is me on the right. A few things about this shot. Um, you'll notice all throughout, these are uh, Buddhist prayer flags that uh, dot the tops of all of the, the major mountain peaks. Here's a portion of the Nepal national flag. Um, I'm very easy to pick out in the pictures, by the way. If you can always see, I've got my uh, hand sanitizer bottle hanging off to the side. Um, in any event, in this particular shot, the crowd has cleared out. Um, we're enjoying our last few seconds on the top of the mountain. I can tell that because the goggles are down, the mask is back on. I've got one arm in the backpack. I'm about to put the other arm in the backpack. I just finished talking to my wife on a satellite telephone. And I'm just taking that last look from the top of the world before I uh, head out. And what I love about this shot and what also haunts me about this shot actually is that I can't remember what I was, what was going through my mind when I was looking at it, but I'm sure I was thinking about something pretty awesome. So there's the, there's the storyline. I made it, 10 fingers, 10 toes, all came back with me and we'll make a trip uh, back uh, in time. Most people climb Everest over a 12, an eight to a 12 week period, usually two to three months. Uh, we did it in five weeks, door to door. That includes 
couple of days of travel each way and days to be tourists. So we think that we were the fastest team on the mountain. One of the things that I learned about is if you want to do something extraordinary, you may have to figure out how to change the rules. Uh, going for two or three months was not an option for me. Um, I was not going to go suffer for that long on that mountain. I was never going to ask for that kind of time off from work. And I had to do it another way. And uh, we formed our own team. We knew each other to be very strong climbers. And one of our, of our team members knew how to map this out so that we could do it safely in five weeks. And so we changed the rules and we did it. And uh, we all kept our families and our jobs intact. To be able to do something uh, like Everest, uh, it requires just off the charts uh, preparation. One of the few things you can control is your fitness. I've been a, a fitness fanatic for decades, but when I started climbing big mountains, uh, I had to really ramp it up. And for Everest, I even ramped it up further. We're empty nesters. My wife at the time had just started graduate school, so the stars aligned where I could just train. And, and I do this, much of this today, uh, 65 pound packs in both pictures, uh, ankle weights uh, in the training, and this altitude training mask that I wore for many months uh, to be able to build up my lung strength so that the, the lungs uh, could physically absorb more red blood cells. Here's the team. Um, I am uh, the runt of the litter here. Uh, we're not standing on a level playing field, but uh, there's just no way that the short guy uh, was gonna be the weak, weak link in the chain. Uh, all three of my teammates were born in the same year and I'm 15 years older than them. So I felt I had to train a little bit more than all of them. But if we go left to right, uh, for me, uh, we're all chasing the seven summits of the world. These are the highest mountains on each of the seven continents. There's only several hundred people that have done that in their lifetime. And for me, this was my first trip to Everest. Uh, and when I hit the summit, it became my fifth of the seven. I've since done another one. So I've done six of the seven summits of the world. Next to me is Fabian, a businessman from Australia. This was his first attempt as well. And when he, he hit the summit, that was his seventh. He completed the cycle. My two other teammates, this was their second attempt. The year before, they were turned around 300 vertical feet from the summit on account of high winds. This is Tom, he's a commercial airline pilot, and when he hit the summit with us, uh, that was his sixth. And finally, this is Dave, our leader. Uh, when he hit the summit, that was uh, his um, seventh of the seven summits, and um, we were glad to have him there. Now this is about day four, hiking into base camp. This is a, um, a shrine at, the, at, the, at Teng Bo Shea is the name of this little village. I point this out because way off here in the distance is the summit of Everest. This, this is not Everest. This is a mountain block in our view, but we can just see peeking through the top, one of our first glances of that mountain from a distance. On the way to base camp, this is around 15,000 feet, you're required to go through a uh, memorial to the climbers that have died on the mountain. At this point, there's around 310 to 315 people that have died on this mountain. And each one of these rock figures or uh, statues represents someone that's dead. For those of you that are Everest junkies and may have seen the, the movie Everest that's based on Into Thin Air, the 96 disaster. This is where Scott Fisher, the swashbuckling uh, guide, uh, has his memorial. If you look out on the horizon, you can see memorial, 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 all around just circling the place for the 315 people that are, are dead. I, uh, I have this view because I wanted to show how I kept track with uh, people and how they kept track of me. I had this satellite enabled device that um, broadcast my location to an open internet uh, map. And other than that, in contrast to the Google uh, Maps blue dot that moves with you, this would set down markers at 10 minute increments. I had plotted out the course with flags so people could see where we were. They could hover over at sea uh, our elevation and there was an arrow when we were on the move and they could track us. It also allowed me to have very short bursts of text messaging back and forth uh, to home or to, to post small little statements on Facebook. Couldn't see Facebook with it, but at least it was my window to the world. 
One of the questions people ask is, why do you climb? And one of the reasons is for views like this one. Um, rather than go through um, an extra trip through the ice fall, we drop back down the mountain and climb the 20,000 foot mountain here. And this is about 4.30 in the morning. And you can see just the incredible red and, and pink hues that, uh, that are cascading on the clouds. This just, you know, take your breath away. That's one of the reasons why we do some of this craziness. And then at the top of the summit uh, of this 20,000 foot peak. I wanted to pause here and talk for a minute about altitude and why it, and how it kills and, and impacts people. The biggest issue with altitude is the change in atmospheric pressure. We can't feel atmospheric pressure, but we can feel changes. So for example, it, when you take off in an airplane or you go in an, um, an elevator in a big building or you drive in a moderately sized hill, your ears pop. And your ears are popping because your, your body is trying to recalibrate the pressure that's inside your head with the new pressure that's out around it. And the higher you go, the, more, or the, the less uh, pressure that you've got. So it does two things to you. One is if you go up too fast for your body, as the pressures change, fluids that are naturally occurring in your body leach into places where they shouldn't be, like your brain or your lungs. And your brain is called high altitude cerebral edema, where the brain swells. Or in your lungs, high altitude pulmonary edema, or water in the lungs. It's like COVID-19, it's like pneumonia, where it fills your lungs up. So life on a big mountain is, is life in slow motion, trying to go slowly, it's constant up and down and up and down and go up and spend the night and up and spend the night and come back down. You don't just go climb a big mountain. The body can't take it. And your body will acclimatize to about a thousand vertical feet a day once you're already in the altitude. And um, you do the math, it just takes a long time to do a big mountain because the body just can't take it. So when we say we climbed Everest, we climbed it about, we climbed much of it three times. Not certainly the top, but, but much of it. So here's base camp. Get a, get a flavor for size. Let's see the, the route coming in. You can see the bodies. You can see the climbers coming in. Climbers, climbers, climbers on their way where they are welcomed at the big rock saying you've arrived at base camp. Here's the Kumbo Icefall coming up this direction. Notice to the side of the icefall, you can see rocks that just have a little bit of snow and ice on them. You can also see really thick ice right here. It's very thick, you can see it. Maybe not as thick here. Why do I point that out? Well, uh, in 2014, at the start of the climbing season, uh, that area right in here broke loose in the middle of the night when it was full of Sherpas in the ice fall and it killed 16 of them. The mountain was closed down. A year later, at the start of the climbing season, um, there was a big earthquake in Nepal that killed 10,000 people. And a mountain on the other side let loose with a bunch of ice and it dropped down in the valley and this big wall of ice and water came charging through the center of base camp and killed 20. And the mountain closed down again. So just in this picture, you are looking at um, a spot where 36 people died within one year. We were camped up in here. This is uh, actually breaking down the camp. This is where people are coming into the town. This is where the first picture I showed you was, was shot of our, of our guide looking up to the mountain. And over here is where those, the ice came breaking down through base camp. This is not Everest, but a very good view of the ice fall. And uh, here is um, an altar. It's a Buddhist altar. While the um, Paul is a, is a Buddhist in a Hindu nation. 100% of the staff are, are Buddhist. And they won't even take you up until you go through what they call a puja ceremony, which is a, something that's supposed to give you good luck. And you leave some of your gear on the side of the, of the altar and it's blessed. And then here I'm getting a blessing from um, a Buddhist Lama. He's tying a yellow band around my neck with knots that's supposed to represent good luck. And I kept that on until I, I got home. Let's take a three minute detour to a videotape that was put together by one of my teammates. I mean, it's his video, he's prominently featured in it, but it's only three minutes. It's had almost a million views. And it shows you some of the dangers that we faced 
And what you see of one, you see of all of us. Uh, you know, whoever did something, we all we all did it. So let's let's hope our sound works here. Can you all see? Deb, shake your head if you see here, and then Deb, shake your head head if you can hear the sound. All the friends, family, courage, Sangay, Cheryl, heroes, most importantly, Brooklyn, Ellie, Sadie, the love of my life, Tiffany, you guys were there every step of the way. It's a beautiful place to be. Take a look at our view. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so here's a really good shot of the ice fall while I'm sitting in my tent. So the route basically goes up this way. And the avalanche that you saw when we were in it went through here. So the next day, uh, it was a rest day and I was looking up at the ice fall and I heard a big explosion, almost like dynamite. And I looked up and a huge chunk of ice here broke off. It fell into the fall triggering an avalanche right where we've been the day before. Um, I saw a, one of the questions asked in advance, you know, what was the hardest thing for you? And that was the hardest thing for me was this notion of going back up in that fall after the near miss in it, and then the miss here, and all the avalanches that were going on around us in that valley. That was certainly a, a kind of a moment of truth, but I kept going, so I guess it didn't bother me too much. Inside the ice fall, um, just give you an idea of it. I know that doesn't look like a route, but that is a route through the ice fall. Um, I don't know how my colleagues had the presence of mind to photograph the, uh, the avalanche when it went past us, but here we go, All right? So I'm here with my bottle. This is how we protect ourselves, uh, if you can call it that much. Uh, I'm anchored through a rope on this main rope that's anchored, you, a, a screw has been placed into the ice that, uh, it's called a fixed line, and that's how we hook on to it all the time. For extra protection, we add this device. It's called a Jumar or an ascender. It's a one-way brake that you put onto the, onto the rope and you pull and you pull. 
which is one of the reasons why you spend so much time weight training before you go up so that you can build up your strength to pull on that thing for days on end. And uh, getting used to the ladders, I did this, uh, I practiced this in my front yard before we went. A lot of things in the ice fall that you can fall into or fall on top of you. And this is the equivalent of uh, walking between the World Trade Towers on, on a ladder supported only by a rope. Uh, this is quite a challenge. I got better at it, but I never got used to the, that huge exposure of the potential falling in there. It's even harder when you got three ladders all latched together and you have to go across it. You saw this in the video, pretty deep, very deep down in there. Uh, not always uh, do you find ladders, and sometimes you don't even find ropes. You just jump and you hope for the best. Seen that shot. Now here's camp one, here's our tents, and Everest is up this way. You can actually see some of the route. Out here, comes around and up. This is the first time that, you, that we get to see the mountain in its full glory. And uh, it was quite overwhelming to me when I saw it really for the first time. And it's hard to take your eyes off it. And quite honestly, it, it uh, it caused me to, th to think, am I big enough for this moment here? Not can my five foot seven inch frame do it, but do I have the drive and the, the fortitude to suffer the way I'm gonna have to suffer to go up there? And I figured out a really important lesson that I apply in my life. Um, and it's this one, it's that you know, finding the right balance between looking up and looking down. And what I mean by that is, I found that if I just stared at that summit all the time, it just got depressing, it was too much. But if I just kept my head down, I was missing all kinds of good stuff along the way. And so I, I just had to find that right balance where I didn't get overwhelmed. I got my bearings and looked down, look up and so forth. And I, I called my wife at camp too. And I said, Susan, I got it figured out. And I, th and I think this is a really good um, lesson in life, right? Whatever the it may be, is that right balance between keeping your eye on something you really want to do, but not getting discouraged versus just kind of running in place. Now we're on our way to camp two. Uh, now you can see the summit. Here we go. You can see a lot of snow blowing off of Everest and snow blowing off of Lhotse. That means that the wind up there is 40, 50 plus miles an hour and you can't go up there. Uh, they can't put the fixed lines in, the ropes, and you get blown off the mountain and you can't dress warmly enough to protect yourself. Uh, Everest is right in the middle of the jet stream and year round the jet stream hits it and like clockwork every year around May 15th ish to May 22nd ish somewhere in there the jet stream moves off of the mountain and you can climb up and then the jet stream goes back and the whole thing is of all this up and down up and down the mountain is to get yourself ready so that you are acclimatized when that um, jet stream moves that you can run for us, when we were there in 2018, it was, the jet stream was off, or they call it the weather window, was as big as it's ever been. So for eight days, people could go up and that big crowd could spread out. Whereas last year, that weather window was as tight as it's ever been. It was just a couple of days and that massive humanity all got stuck up there and like 12 people died. The mountain closed for five days. Uh, it was just too, too windy and we all had to retreat and wait. Now here's camp two, the top of camp two. I'll show you the route and you can get perspective of the small climbers. You can see the route, you can see the climbers. Climbers, climbers, camp three, up, up climbers and on our way up there. Camp two is, um, I call it more of a MASH unit, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. There's no medical personnel there, but uh, people come down from there with um, broken bones, with frostbite, with extreme altitude sickness, and the Sherpas help them, and they put them on this helicopter that stops at Camp Two to take the the, the wounded down. For those of you that uh, read into thin air, this is where Beck Weathers was um, rescued. Uh, the air the uh, helicopter flight costs anywhere from twenty five thousand to forty thousand dollars to get out of there, which is why we all buy insurance. Um, I wanted to, I think I'm doing okay on time. I, I wanted to stop here and talk a little bit about some of the deaths on the mountain, of which there were five when I was there, two in this camp. 
Um, one happened at this very spot that you're looking at. Um, the, the helicopter lands there because it's flat. There's no cracks in the ice. It seems relatively safe. There's no ropes. Um, I went over there one day on my own. I just went there you know, nonchalantly to check it out, kind of the equivalent of going to go check the mail. It's about as much as I thought about it. We've now summited. We're about to drop down into the ice fall for our final trip. And coming up out of the ice fall is a Sherpa with his client. And it happened to be the same Sherpa that my two friends had used the year before. They knew him well. And you get to know these guys very well. They were big hugs. I got to meet the guy. It was very nice. We went down. They went up. A few days later, that Sherpa's client uh, was stricken with frostbite and needed a helicopter rescue. And the Sherpa brought him up to this, to this spot and waited for the helicopter. And as the helicopter comes, comes in, it throws up a lot of wind. It just tipped over the Sherpa. He hit the ice, bang, he dropped through the ice, fell mortally wounded into a big hole of the ice. And while they got him out, he died beforehand. Um, you know, right where we'd all been walking, it was just, you know, I walked the right day and he walked the wrong day at that spot. The second person that died at this camp is a pretty famous Japanese climber. Uh, he failed to reach the summit for the eighth time in a row when we were there. On one of those attempts, he lost, due to, due to frostbite, nine of his fingers. And uh, what do you do when you've lost most of your fingers? Uh, he decided to go the hardest way up the mountain and failed and came back into the tent and uh, died in his tent, probably of a heart attack or a stroke. That's what gets you at nighttime. Uh, by the time he died, I was further down the mountain waiting for my turn on a helicopter to fly off and out comes this body on a stretcher and I figured he'd earned it. I saw the picture online of, of that uh, happening that's where I was standing, that's the color of the helicopter, so I assumed that was his body. That's two of the five. Now making our way up the Lhotse face, you can see how incredibly um, steep it is. I'm featured prominently here, that's my foot. Um, in this, uh, situ in this uh, picture, my teammate is coming off of one rope and going on to a new one. What happens here, I wanna change my view so I can see if you can see my hands is that what you do is that you grab that rope that you're leaving and you unhook, and then you hook it to the next rope and you let go. If you have two devices, you grab it, you put one up and you hook, you take the other one and you, and you hook it. So that when you're using just one device, there's that moment that the only thing that's anchoring you to the mountain is your hand, which is very exposed. And the reason I say that is that while we were moving up, there was a, a, a Chinese a female climber right below the summit who was using one point of protection, which is what you would have used at that spot. And as she was unhooking at that very second, as she unhooked, she got hit by a blast of wind. It blew her backwards. And the initial word was she, she fell to her death. A Sherpa saw what was going on. He was highly skilled mountaineer. He unhooked to try and go down and, and rescue her. He likewise fell crushing a bunch of ribs. And um, long story short, Nobody could get to him for 24 hours. And so on his own, he, with broken ribs, uh, he, through 24-hour period, got himself down to Camp 2. And I was there when he came into the camp, barely alive. And I saw his teammates, you know, pick up that limp body and put him on the chopper. And I think he was okay. Uh, the good news is that Chinese uh, woman who fell actually survived. So good news all around. But it's just that fortuitous moment of unhooking where... You end up falling versus the rest of us. You know, we didn't get blown off the mountain. This is camp three, a place where you wouldn't want to spend any time. Those are the prime spots to camp, if that looks like a prime spot. Mine was a little bit lower on the steep end where it's so difficult to, to find a flat area. You just chop a, a, a right angle at a little platform to put your tent, and you just go in the tent and you stay there. Many people have slipped walking around this, this camp and just felt to their death. There's nothing to stop you in that camp. So now we're gonna start um, our summit push. Uh, helmets on, masks on, and we're gonna have a 36 hour, almost nonstop day before we're gonna have any opportunity to sleep. We're gonna head up, we're gonna pick up this rope, we're gonna pass those tents, we're gonna go where those climbers are and spend nine hours working our way up to here. I was in the lead walking right up here past this tent and I came across a climber a little older than me who was seated on the, in the snow um, in a catatonic state. Eyes were open, 
but no one was home. Uh, he wasn't wearing a, a ma an oxygen mask. He didn't have the one-piece summit suit on, no helmet, uh, unresponsive, and our team tried to help him and others tried to help him. Long story short, as we came back down the next day, uh, he was dead in the tent and uh, the tent was open. I chose not to look in, others did, but uh, that was number three. Um, number four death happened in the bigger company of which we were a part. It happened up high on the summit where a Sherpa brought his two business, European businessmen to the summit. And uh, as a publicity stunt, those two businessmen buried whatever their product was in the, on the summit and offered a $50,000 reward for anybody that could find it. And then they took off uh, with no thought of how their Sherpa was doing. And um, they just left and didn't do anything to try and help him. And all that was recovered of the Sherpa was his backpack. So clearly the Sherpa had altitude sickness, did something crazy, and that was the end of him. That was all over the internet because they just were so callous. Um, that's the fourth death and the fifth death happened on the other side of the mountain, which I did not, I would not have impacted us at all or known anything about it. Up on the big open face of the mountain, and um, it, this is sub-zero weather, but what's happening here is that the sun's rays are hitting the ice and reflecting back into us and just cooking us. And uh, it really did a number on me with the heat. And when I rolled into camp four, here I am here rolling into camp four, I, I was spent. I, I was really burned up by the heat. And it had turned out I'd also been out of oxygen. It must have been for a couple of hours. And I thought that this was over. I thought, um, I've done all this training. I've spent all this money. Um, and I'm, I don't have the strength to go up into the death zone. And... Uh, a teammate came up to me and said, Dan, you know, there's no refund on these oxygen bottles. Use it. So I took a fresh bottle into my tent and I put that baby on full blast. And boy, did I just roared back to life. I started eating and drinking and I felt like a human being again, which is a good thing because we still had some very serious uh, real estate to cover. Here's the top of the tents at four. The route's gonna come over this way. For, for those of you that read Into Thin Air, this is where those climbers were huddled that uh, perished because they couldn't find the, the camp. You'll see dots representing the climbers on the route. Climbers, 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 up to the balcony, remember that spot? Um, and then along up to here, that is not the summit, but you get the idea. Now, just right about here, just literally outside of the camp, we enter the death zone. It's called the death zone because you are on the clock. You've got about 30 hours to go up and back before you'll die, straight and simple. Uh, at that elevation, your body cannot adjust to altitude, even with oxygen. Uh, your body does not recover, and you're basically just living on your body. Uh, body systems shut down, and uh, you're just kind of going on your own power. Around eight o'clock at night, lights on and we head up into the night for nine hours of total darkness um, heading up that mountain. Six hours out we took our first break when we hit the balcony and I thought I might be able to see better if I removed my goggles and when I did my goggle hit one of my contact lenses out of my eye and I had uh, no way to recover it and in a minus 20 a goggle a soft soft contact lens doesn't survive so now I have 20-20 vision in one eye and 2400 in the other with no hope of uh, depth perception. And you'll see later, boy, did I need it, but I didn't have it. I also thought maybe I ought to eat a snack. I wasn't hungry, but I thought I should. And, and I bit into this snack that looks a lot like a big Tootsie Roll, only gooier. And when I bit into it with the cold temperatures, it popped a cap off of my tooth exposing a, a live ground down stump. Um, I don't know if you've ever had anything cold on a bad tooth, but I was sucking in minus 20 air and it didn't feel so good. And I was eight days away from a, a dentist and the best I could do was just put that tooth in my pocket and tell my guide, no more breaks, nothing more can go wrong. Nine hours out, the stun, sun starts to come out off to our right. Uh, this is the sun coming up out of Tibet. You can see how steep it is. It almost looks like the moon, and then it gets really steep, really steep. And I made the mistake when I was around this area to look at the, the sun coming up, and I saw how steep it was, and I just thought, how in the world am I going to get down? 
I figured I'd deal with it when I had to. As the sun is to your right, the shadow of the summit is off to the left. There's the, 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 that's the summit shadow. And as we climb further and further, the biggest mountains in the world are under our feet. We, uh, and these look like airplane shots because we're as high as the airplanes. Uh, time will not allow me to talk much about this slide. That is the summit. Uh, on this particular, uh, this set of pictures is the south summit looking at the summit. And the picture on the right is the summit looking down at the summit. So if you look at my hand, you come up, you hit the south summit, you go down, and you go up. And we're standing here looking at this ridge. You can see the wind is blowing like crazy. There's one rope, two lanes of traffic, a 6,000 foot fall into Nepal on the left, a 10,000 foot fall into Tibet on the right. And the way you deal with that one is that you have to, when the climber coming down has to unhook from the rope. And you hang on to the climber that you're passing, and you reach around them, and then you click again. And you come to the next climber and you hang on to them and you let go and you then rehook. It's a very slow process. I don't have time. I want to get to, you know, there's so many questions here. I'm going to roar through a couple of these. We'll just keep going here. Uh, that's me. The first time I saw this spot, I thought that was a part of the summit. I started crying, thinking I've made it. It turns out that that spot was this spot. But I'm almost there. I mean, we're somewhere in there. I don't know where I am, but we're, we're on the summit. And here's my online map. I had plotted out, I put a marker in the summit. Here's the summit, I'm on the move. I had pre-programmed into my device this message. I am standing on the summit of Mount Everest. It hit Facebook, it hit my map, my family's cell phones. And you can see our elevation, 29,030 feet. Um, we were one foot below the summit. I, I did not want to peer over the other edge of the summit because you'll see in a minute why. Uh, so here we are on the summit, happy days. Life is good. All four of us on the summit, Tom, Dan, Fabian, Dave. Bring in the Sherpas, one, two, three, and I'm behind the sign. What I wanted to show you, here's the rope, we're all off the rope. Uh, the summit cannot accommodate you, uh, if everybody on the summit, so you gotta unhook. And there was no way I was gonna walk around that summit unhooked. So I just parked my can in the center and I said, this is fine. I'll look at the other pictures later. Sooner or later, you got to come down. Here's the summit over here, and there is me. There's your, you know, five, six thousand foot fall, and here's your eight, ten thousand foot fall over here. This is the area where those two climbers fell that I told you about that survived. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Back in regular formation, following our Sherpa, there is Camp 4. You can see how high we are, and you can see some of the route. Follow the red dot, down the Lhotse face, and down. And in case you're interested, that's a dead body right there. Didn't know it was a dead body until we got there, but that's a dead body. Rolling into Camp 4, you can see how much trash is in Camp 4. Uh, you know, you want to talk about in, uh, environmental impact, Camp 4 is a dump. It's a 26,000 foot dump and an open cesspool. Um, it's really disgusting up there and they don't do anything to encourage people taking things down and I wasn't focused on it, I was just trying to stay alive, but I'm rolling into camp four here. And all the way down to camp two in 36 hours. So in a 36 hour period, we went from camp three to four, I gotta see if you can see my hanging. We went from camp three to camp four to the summit to four to three to two in 36 hours and I just collapsed when I got back into two. I, I was done. No more exercise. I, I can't take it. That, that was enough. Still got to get out of the ice fall and uh, dropping in for one last fun time in the ice fall. Uh, there's base camp back there. And just before we step out, the little <whistles> we're alive, life is good. And we got into base camp and had a shower, dry clothes, big Western style congratulatory meal. And I collapsed in front of my teammates and uh, I'm just glad I wasn't slobbering. It took so much out of me. That's, this was 56 hours of going with just two or three hours of sleep um, the night before. It was pretty cold and I was pretty wet the night before. 
it took a lot out of me. I'm just, I'll stop at this point is that uh, this is day three on the left. I think I look pretty healthy there. And, you know, I'm 15 pounds lighter here. Uh, we all lost between 50, 15 and 20 pounds and it was all muscle weight. No one started their head. So I think I'm going to stop right there. Um, I want to get to some of these questions. You don't run out of stories. You run out of time for questions. So I'm going to switch here to the uh, museum staff. And I assume that some of those questions, how many of your questions are there? 30 something? Are there probably some duplicates? Let's fire away. Hey, Dan, I'm just going to go back to the top of the chat real quick here for us. Some more comments and people interacting. So I'm just going to go back to the beginning. Okay. Um, one question that comes from Tony is, have other teams made the climb in that time five weeks? It sounds like quite an accomplishment. And is it uncommon to make the summit on your first attempt? Um, do many do that? Sounds like not. Yeah, not many people do it on their first attempt. We were very fortunate. Uh, the stars aligned for us on that trip. Um, I'm not aware of anybody else that um, has done it in five days, uh, five weeks. Um, really four when you think of the time on the mountain. Uh, there certainly were some professional climbers up there that were doing some speed climbing, we'll call it, kind of super fast, super light, but they, they weren't doing what we were doing, going all the way up. So we think that, uh, I mean, it's doable. I'm sure we're not the only ones that have done it that way, but just a fraction of people do it that way. Absolutely. Um, some of the questions did get answered from other members in the group chat. Um, someone did ask though, how did you get funded? Um, and how did you meet, how did you all meet up for the first time? And I'll let you start there and then I can filter in a few more. Well, I was privately funded, I will say that much, but I got a deal that I could not turn down. It fell out of the sky on me. My teammate that's in the mountaineering industry has a very successful business and this operating company were desperate for him to refer business to them. They threw the kitchen sink at him, including a whole bunch of helicopter rides and I was along for the ride. So I, I got funded. Uh, I, now, I spent a lot of money, but nothing like the you know, $80,000 that most, most Americans are spending. Um, and how did we meet? So uh, I fortuitously met two of my teammates um, in the Andes. Uh, very long story short, but I was wearing a, a baseball cap from the same university they'd gone to. And University of Utah, as a matter of fact, I'm from Salt Lake City. So I met two of them that way, and then we were on, in Alaska climbing together. And then one of those two uh, was in Antarctica and his team blew up in bad weather and another team's team blew up in bad weather. And as those remaining teams were combined, uh, that's where those you know, one from one team, one from another, and that's how they became friends. And we just formed our own team that way. We knew we were very strong. We'd been in some pretty tough spots together. We all used the same training book. We held each other accountable to make sure that we were on track with this phenomenal regimen of exercise, and uh, that's how we were able to do it. Sure. Um, another question um, from the same person was, is there any particular gear you were happy that you had with you or gear that you were sorry that you brought on this uh, trip with you? I brought everything I needed. Uh, we planned for many months and checked lists and compared notes. I, I wasn't missing anything. and. Um, Really important thing was that summit suit on summit night to stay alive and, a, and, and that uh, tracker that I took was a lifesaver. It was my lifeline of the world. Sure. Um, another question was um, in the preparation phase, did you sleep in a hypoxic tent to prepare? I did not. I just used the, uh, the, the training mask. Okay. Some used that, that uh, tent, I did not. Um, do you have any desire to do Ama uh, Doblum? Apologize if I said that wrong. Ama Doblum. Uh, no. Ama Doblum, for those of you that don't know what that's about, it's a mountain we actually walked right past on the way up to Everest. It's a very steep, very scary, dangerous mountain, and I'm not sure I want to go do any more that I'm really at risk as I would be there. Sure. Uh, this kind of is related to another question. Uh, any other plans um, what, to finish the other seven summits? Yeah, I go back and forth about the seventh. I really would like to. Uh, it's shockingly expensive. It's amazing how expensive it is because the only people that want to go there are the people that want to look at the penguins or that want to climb the seven summits in Antarctica. Um, so there's monopoly pricing. They just crush you. And I don't know if I want to be that cold again. We'll see. But I, I certainly think about it routinely if I'm going to go back. Sure. 
Um, and one question from our staff members um, is, did you ever think of turning back? No. Okay. I thought some, there might be some environmental impact questions in there. We, um, there was actually one. Um, how did you mitigate your impact on the Everest environment? So that did come up. Well, we weren't throwing trash around. I'll say, I will say that much, but I, I, um, I think we were very conscious of, of using trash cans and making sure things were carried out that way. Um, but the bottom line is of the big mountains I've been on, um, Everest is a free for all. They don't enforce anything like some of the other mountains do. And uh, it's, it's got a lot of places that it's a sewer and a pigsty and a whole lot more could have been done. Uh, but they're just not policing it and reminding people. And when you get into extreme altitude, you're trying to stay alive. But uh, if there were reminders and people helping, it would go a long way. Sure. And then I'll, I'll ask one more question. And then maybe um, for some of the other technical ones, uh, Dan, I'll, I'll ask, I'll give my email and participants can certainly email me to follow up and I can forward um, for additional questions after that for you. One was, is how many rotations at upper camps did you do on the shortened schedule? Three, although it would have been four because we climbed another mountain that uh, I showed you. Okay. I'm going to um, have our director, Deb Starker, uh, just come back on live for a moment to just give a, a wrap up for us. Um, hey, I am there. Thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, I mean, we still have maybe have you know, a minute or two if someone has something that Dan hasn't answered. Um, but um, I, for one, found this fascinating. I am one of those, um, you know, Everest junkies. I see all the movies, I read all the books. Um, I um, was in Africa um, several years ago, and um, I, we actually flew into Arusha, which is right near Mount Kilimanjaro. And um, that was one of the things that I thought, and I do have a friend who climbed Kilimanjaro, so um, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll start there, but um, not, not really. Um, but it is really wonderful. I mean, this is just such an accomplishment and such, um, you know, an amazing test of not just you know, physical strength, but I think mental strength and just fortitude and just, you know, I loved some of the things that you were saying about, you know, how, how you know, the lessons that you learned. Um, so, um, oh, wait a minute. We have... Yeah, can, I, can I just stop you and, and do one show and tell item that, that I wanted Absolutely. to... Absolutely. Oh my gosh, yeah. So uh, right when I was below the summit, just, just literally a few vertical feet below, we were held up and one of my teammates uh, pointed down to my feet and we saw these, these little rocks, um, which is unusual because the mountain's really covered. And I thought, what a cool idea. And if we were all together, I'd let you all touch it and pass it around, but this is the best we can do with technology. Uh, this is as close as anybody's going to get to the top of the world with a rock. Uh, there were no rocks on the summit. It was covered. But, you know, just a few feet below, this is over 29,000 feet high. I wanted to at least show that to you that, uh, you know, you, you reach out virtually and touch the top of the world. Um, uh, it's, it's an important memento to me, and I, and I really like sharing it with people. I mean, for all you know, I got it out of the creek in my backyard. But if you were to see it closer, it's, a, it's dark, just like the dark uh, granite that you see on the top. Anyway, I wanted to show my uh, show and tell. Yeah, thank you. No, that's great. I mean, it's, you know, this is something you'll have with you, uh, aside from the memories, just some physical manifestation. Um, any, any other questions that we haven't answered yet? Yeah, two more did come in. Um, someone who had a follow up to the environmental one is who brings the trash down? Um, pretty much the whole uh, nature country of India is full of trash. Sounds like Camp 4 is what somebody said. Yeah, the most trash is at 4. Um, in theory, each Sherpa is required to bring down 20 pounds uh, each trip down because they're running uh, tents and, and oxygen tanks up there all the time. They're supposed to bring it down. I would have been happy to bring down 20 pounds, but I was trying to keep alive. But in theory, it's the Sherpas that do it. Sure. And uh, how did your wife and kids feel about you doing the climb? Well, my wife climbed Kilimanjaro. We did it together, so she understands... Um, the passion for doing it. And she could see that I was pretty happy doing it. And she actually encouraged me to do it. She hasn't encouraged me to do some other ones that I've talked about, but she was uh, actually the driving force in great part to feel that you know, I had the freedom to go do it. Sure. And then someone also just wrote in, uh, which book did you say you used for training? Uh, training for the New Alpinism. 
Okay. Um, again, Dan, we can't thank you enough. This was really spectacular. Nancy, um, I know you're on here somewhere. Thank you for putting us in touch with Dan. Um, you know, we, um, we're, we're fortunate to have such a great staff that, uh, that thinks about all these great things. Um, please, you know, check out our website at the museum. Um, we have tons of, of uh, other programs and we're going to do some other ones. Um, we'd love your support. We'd love you to be a friend of the museum. Um, so thank you again so much. Um, um, www.metc.org is our um, website. Thank you, Jenny, for that reminder. Um, and every, anyway, thank you. Everyone, please be safe, be well, and, uh, and we hope you enjoyed this. Thanks. Thanks. And good night.